who is, who is, who is a physicist by training, but a colleague in the chemistry department, and he is, um, yeah, uh, his research field is theoretical nanoscience, and his, um, he will speak about war and pieces of metal, a tale from the scientific front. Yes. I'm glad to see that I'm not the only troublemaker in the chemistry department. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian, for that. Is there a pointer? Sebastian has one. Like in this? And no way me turn Ah, you want to catch it. Okay, so great. Um, let me first thank Ute. I have a, I have a point. No, it's fine. It's okay. You okay. can see him with the arrow. Um, and thank Ute for inviting me. I'm going to talk about something which is tangent to the uh, uh, theme of the... Closer? No, it's okay. It's just that maybe you can switch the... Switch what? Let the tech guys do the best. I'll do my worst. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. So uh, let me first thank Ute for inviting me. And um, this is a story about science. So there's going to be some science here, but it's also a story about the politics of science and, and uh, uh, my adventures along those lines. And um, much support should, come, should go to Jonathan Sivan, my collaborator at Electrical Engineering and Josh Baraban, and supporting actors, Anat Milo and Maya Barsadan, who taught me all the chemistry I know, and trust me, that's very, very little. Um, I'd like to start from um, Carl Sagan's book. Carl Sagan is probably one of the uh, best uh, um, uh, science uh, uh, communicators. I grew up watching uh, Cosmos as a kid. We had a VCR, you remember those devices? And in this book, The Demon Haunted World, he has a list of a, a ruse which will allow you to recognize baloney. It's the art of recognizing bullshit in science. Sorry for the uh, French. And it's a very long and very detailed uh, list. I only give you a partial list of that. Um, detect appeal to authority. That's an immensely important uh, uh, thing. And authority comes in many forms and, uh, and shapes. We've already heard uh, uh, Sebastian say something like, this is a very good journal, right? You heard that about nature catalysis and so on. That's a form of appeal to uh, authority. Test more than one hypothesis, of course. Don't become attached to your own theory. Quantify. Um, craft experiments carefully. Look at the raw data. Every link in a chain of arguments must be correct, otherwise everything falls apart. Make sure your thesis is falsified, you know, be as Popperian as you can, and use Occam's razor whenever you can. It's just a partial list, and I recommend everyone here to read chapter 12 at least. It makes your science much, much better, in my opinion. And um, with this list in mind, okay, uh, uh, how do I... Try to take a mental picture of this list. Things from this list will come soon. Um, I'm going to give you a crash course in catalysis. This will exhaust all my knowledge in chemistry, pretty much. So chemistry is the a field where uh, uh, materials come together and change from two reactants to a product, right? You know, whatever you know these molecules are doing. And a physicist's view of this is very, very trivial. Um, you have something called a coordinate, right, which is some parameter of the molecule. It's very easy to think about a, 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 a molecule made of two atoms. There the coordinate is simply the distance between the atoms. But if you have a more complicated reaction, then the coordinate is some, you know, combination of positions, whatever. And this is on the x-axis and on the uh, y-axis, you have the energy. Right? How much energy it takes or costs to move from different formations of your system. So you start with an initial state and oh, how much you would like to go to the final state and do the reaction. But alas, there is a barrier. Right? And chemistry happens if the system 
can actually cross this barrier. You can think about it as a kid playing football and he's bouncing around the football. If the football can cross this tiny mountain, then it will fall into the uh, final set, never come back, and you have your reaction. This is all I know about chemistry. And so the question really is, where is this energy to go from this state over the hill and down to the final state? Where is it coming from? And typically, the simple uh, solution is that you can heat your system up. Heating, heat is just motion of a, a, your molecule. So your system is heated up, it's moving around, that gives it energy. Some of your molecules will have enough energy to bounce off this uh, hill and go to the final state and you have a reaction. And this was already realized in 1889 by this guy, Svante Arrhenius, who wrote an amazingly important uh, formula for that. And it tells us that the rate of catalysis, uh, the, sorry, the rate of reaction, you know, how many reactions will take place per unit time, will be proportional to the exponent of this energy scale divided by the temperature. So the larger the temperature, the smaller the fraction, there's a minus sign here, so the reaction will be, a, 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 the rate will increase. There will be more of that reaction. And the way to actually see this is do the experiment, right? You take a reaction, whatever reaction you want, you uh, uh, measure the reaction rate um, as a function of the temperature of your reaction chamber, you get all these lines, you get all these points, sorry, and then you fit a, um, a line which looks like the Arrhenius equation, and if it falls together, then you say, oh, we have a simple reaction, it's an Arrhenius reaction, it's, you know, activated, that's the, the official name, and you can actually extract, oh, you can actually extract this number here. It's called the activation energy. This is the parameter of the reaction because it determines essentially everything, right? Or mostly everything. However, using heat to generate reactions is pretty lousy because heat is expensive. You need to burn something to generate that heat. That's not what we want. That's why we do catalysis, like the example that uh, uh, Sebastian showed. And catalysis is a better solution, right? You just plug something in and hopefully the reaction will happen faster even if you don't heat it up. And that's a very nice idea. So in this kind of a, a, a simple picture, a, rea a catalysis would be, whoop, you did something to your system and you know suddenly this uh, energy surface looks very different. Instead of starting from here, you might be starting from here or maybe the barrier will go down. There are different kinds of these kind of catalytic uh, changes, but they all come up to the same thing, right? You need somehow that this barrier between the bottom here and the top here becomes much, much smaller. So the reaction rate becomes much, much faster. And of course, the question is, where are you going to get this energy? There must be some energy given to the system from some source, you know? Uh, um, at least in this form of catalytic reactions that I'm going to talk about here. So um, here comes a crash course in nanoplasmonics. Okay, that's a very, very fancy name. Um, it's a very simple idea. It turns out that if you take a very small metal particle and you shine light on it, then the electrons on the surface of the metal particle start wheeling together like this, they're kind of dancing together. And when they dance together, they have a very efficient way of absorbing a, a light. You can actually see it. Here's an example. This is the absorption spectra, how much light is absorbed at a given wavelength for different diameters of a nanoparticle. If the nanoparticle is big, then nothing happens. The electrons don't feel each other because it's a big sample. But if uh, the, the particle is small, then the electrons on the surface start feeling each other they start dancing in unison, and they have a specific uh, um, wavelength at which they can absorb energy from light very, very easily. Put simply, small particles of metal are a very good antenna. This is the whole field of nanoplasmonics made simple. So the idea of phot plasmonic photocatalysis, you see I'm going up in the uh, ivory tower of jargon, you know, it's a very simple idea. Light is absorbed by a nanoparticle because it's a very good absorber. It's a good antenna. 
an electron from the metal takes that energy. It jumps into the molecule, thus moving it from this surface to the green surface. This is where the energy is coming from, right? We needed some source of energy. Now the molecule can hop through the barrier very, very easily, do its chemistry. The electron goes back to the nanoparticle and you're done. So this is the whole field of plasmonic photochemistry or hot electron photochemistry. We call this hot electron because it's unusually energetic because it absorbed light from, not from heating, but from uh, 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 the energy of the, of the light that was captured by the antenna. So this is a very, very, very nice mechanism. And it's been very, very, very uh, widely used. You can see, I'm going to say, you know, hundreds of papers since 2012-ish that use this mechanism. How do you mean use this mechanism? They take nanoparticles, shine light on them, and uh, uh, catalyze a uh, reaction. And you can also see that these journals are typically very, very, very good. Nature Photonics and Nature Nanotechnology and Science and Nature Catalysis, all these nature style journals. This is very, very impressive, great science. But does it work in theory, right? Of course, it's working in experiment, but does it work in theory? And this is what we were doing, because I'm a theorist. I don't, do, I don't have a bench. I have a, a, a computer and I have a, a notepad and, and, you know, pen and paper. And when we did these calculations, um, sorry, when we did calculations asking what actually happens to electrons in a nanoscale uh, metal when you shine light on it, it turns out that the answer is essentially nothing. They just heat up. Now, this we know, right? You put a, a ball of some metal in the sun, it will heat up. And that actually happens in, in nanoscale uh, uh, particles as well, because the thermalization time, the time it takes for them to just uh, uh, give away their energy and heat up is extremely fast. Oh, the femtosecond. It's a very, very fast process. And that made us curious. How come what we get is that, you know, heating is the only mechanism and hot electrons, you know, these highly energetic electrons that are jumping into the molecule um, um, are negligible. Yet all these papers, really huge amount of papers, huge amount of citations, um, how come they see this? And this is what we set out to understand. And we went to essentially the original paper to show this. And this is uh, a great paper, completely wrong. It's called Hot Electrons Do the Impossible, Plasma-Induced Dissociation of H2 on Gold. And this is basically what they do. They take, uh, um, you know, gold nanoparticles and they put hydrogen molecules on them and they shine light and the hydrogen molecules dissociate. And that's a very expensive process. Its, its energy is four and a half electron volts, you know, this energy barrier. This never happens spontaneously. Never, ever, ever. That's why it's impossible. But it happened for them. And this paper, you know, already has in, by now probably thousands of citations. Uh, uh, Naomi Hallas is the winner of Lamb Award, the Isaacson Award, the Wood Award, and various other awards. So she's an authority in the field. And yet, we started digging into the data. So this is how their experiments look like. They take the nanoparticle, they put it at room temperature, say 24 degrees. Then they heat it to 30 degrees. And you can see some reaction. This is the reaction rate, so the reaction goes up. Uh, sorry, here they, they shine light on it, and they see two things. First, the reaction rate goes up, but also the temperature goes up. And then they say, okay, let's heat it up to this temperature using just an oven. And then they see that when they heat it up, then the reaction rate is much, much smaller than this peak here. So this rate, this excess rate, must be to the hot electron mechanism that I just described. Let me, and they say, okay, the activation energy, that number that we mentioned, goes from 4.5 to 1.7 electron vo volts and the energy comes from hot electrons. That's pretty impressive proof, except you should already 
uh, um, have a light bulb in, in your head because when you look at room temperature, you see that the reaction rate is not zero. So it's already not impossible, right? So already the title is, is kind of misleading. And then we started to, to ask ourselves, can you just sh explain these results just by using Arrhenius theory? Nothing important. So the only thing you need is the assumption that the temperature that they're measuring is not really the temperature on the nanoparticles, which is an incredibly reasonable assumption because temperatures are changing throughout the sample. And if you look at their, uh, uh, ah, I don't have a bigger picture here. If you look at their measurement, the, 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 the thermometer is millimeters below the, the sample. So it's measuring temperature at infinity in chemistry words. So we actually did that. I will not go into the theory, um, into the details. Basically, what you can do is you, is you take the data uh, in the dark without illumination. You extract this number that, why is it jumping? You get this number, which they didn't do in the paper. And this is chemistry 101. And what you get is the number 0.23. Remember they said 4.7 or something, 4.5. You get 0 0.23. It's an amazingly different reaction. And then you take one more point. This point can actually tell you how much your sample is heating, how much your nanoparticles are heating. And with this additional point, not going into the details, you get all the data points, everything. Every single data point they have in their paper is actually fitted with an Arrhenius fit in this graph. Perfect match in terms of, you know, p-value or a, 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 a sigma values. You know, you, uh, everyone who looks at a graph like this tells you, yeah, you pretty much got it right. Especially when I tell him that the red and the orange lines were a, 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 were generated without additional fit parameters. It's just there. So that's a pretty a, a simple idea, right? That they're not measuring the correct a, a temperature. And we started circulating that. And ah, here is the, the figure. They're just measuring, this is their catalytic bed, and this is their heater, and there's millimeters apart. And we started circulating these ideas and talking to them, and they, of course, did not answer us. And we started talking to other people. And then, um, okay, of course, our result is much, much simpler. You're heating up the system, but you don't really measuring the right temperature. That's a much simpler explanation than hot electrons generated, jumping. It's a simpler explanation. And then we realized why they did not answer to us. Because a month after we sent them, they published a paper in Science doing exactly the same thing, well, almost exactly the same thing, using almost exactly the same methodology and getting almost exactly the same results. And short story, long story short, we can reproduce their data from the Science paper quite, you know, perfectly. Again, without the need for many feed parameters, you get one feed parameter from the black line, another point from the rest of the data is enough to generate all the rest of the data because it's just a Arrhenius theory. So that made us very excited, but also very upset because, you know, what's going on? We wrote a comment to science, which was accepted. And it turns out that this experiment was as lousy as experiments get. We wrote a list, essentially endless list of experimental flaws in the, in the science paper. Really, really uh, um, to the level of ridiculousness, and yet it's still there. And then we started saying, okay, this cannot be the only group that's doing that. So we started looking at other papers, for example, the paper by Linich and so on, and they have this uh, um, data, essentially the same data, instead of temperature, they have intensity, and you see this super linearity, 
another high jargon word, you just you plot a, a straight line, and if your data deviates from that line, you call it super linearity, and everyone in nature is happy. And it turns out that you can reproduce those data very, very accurately with a Renius uh, plot. Really, really simple. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? I don't know. Finish. I'm no, finished? Th well, no, we no. take another three minutes of the discussion and we okay. have a short Okay, discussion. so I'm not going to go into the details of how the, the, the uh, um, conferences took place. You can see here's the conference. This is Naomi Halas. This is uh, Jonathan Sivan and this is me. And she's saying something and immediately we stand up and we're saying, you are wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It was the best conference I ever had, <laughs> but it made, you know... It made me feel like a warrior in the Ukrainian army right now. It was a, a, a very tiresome conference. We had amazing uh, um, poster floor arguments with this guy, Phil Christopher, because essentially every piece of data he ever uh, published from his PhD can be reproduced from theory from the 18, late 18, 19th century. And then we started you know, we wanted to publish this, right? You, you want to show the community that you have a better explanation, Occam's Radar, and so on. And we started. So Nature Catalysis received three positive reviews and then decided to, and then decided that the paper was not, um, you know, suitable for Nature Catalysis. Nature nan Nano Letters uh, told us that, unfortunately, I cannot accept your appeal. While you are trying, as you are to correct concepts that were described and published by other Nano Letters, your results are not unique to the Nano Scale. So they, theirs were unique to the Nano Scale, but ours are not. And then he writes, Nano Letter is not a journal that publishes corrections to the work of articles of others, but publishes cutting edge results that are unique to the Nano Scale. Yes. Uh, ACS Photonics, uh, the editor actually personally approached us after this famous conference and said, send me the paper. He read the paper and then he sent us back saying, oh, sorry, I'm not going to publish this. It turns out he was a postdoc of Naomi Halas. <laughs> and so on, eventually it got published. Um, I want to, to read you some stuff from the uh, uh, review reports. Reviewer one says, considering how much research funding has been wasted on promoting research on the putative plasmonically triggered hot electron chemistry by researchers who know nothing about hot electrons and attribute non-physical attributes to them, I think they work by dubious, important, and blah, blah, blah. This is from a referee. So it's quite an unusual referee report. Referee four <laughs> wrote this. The brave manuscript by Dubi et al. And I will say something about it, of course. Addresses the hot topic, blah, blah, blah. The curves could be explained by purely thermal effects. It's not could be, they are explained by thermal effects. We show this. But the, this is the explanation. Only if the experimentalists have made unbelievable errors in the most important aspects of their arguments. This is from the referee report. Um, after we published this, some guy who I don't know um, from USC, University of Southern California, very famous and very important uh, um, university wrote to me, I enjoyed reading your response to the paper on quantifying hot carrier thermoelectronics. I also chose this work as one of the problems in my final exam for thermodynamics and kinetics, aka chemistry 101. This is the level of chemistry there is in our paper. Really, it is. <laughs> and, um, and of course, the saga is not over because... Um, Almost two years ago, the same group published the same paper, essentially again, with the same flaws and the same errors. And we immediately wrote a matters arising, which we saw quite a few of those here. That matters arising was submitted in September 2020, delayed by both editor and the Halas group. Even after three fully supporting reviews, it was formally accepted two months ago and still not published. Where has it gone? I don't know. But I do know that uh, uh, our uh, uh, you know, rivals have a company which uses this technology to do something. So I'm summarizing this story. There's no need to pursue hypeful, complicated explanations, right? There is beauty in the simplicity in the words of Rick Van Duyn, 
probably one of the most famous uh, uh, um, physical chemists or spectroscopists. Be glad that you have found the answer, even if it's not the answer that you are looking for. I mean, they do something. We understand what it is. That should be enough. But unfortunately, it's not in the, in the you know, publishing climate that we are in. Do not be intimidated or overly impressed by glossy journals or celebrity scientists. And here I agree uh, uh, with Anat. The data is the story. That's it. There's no other things to it. It's only the data. Show me the raw data. Make sure that whatever you wrote at the bottom of page 37 in your supplementary material is correct. Trust me, because I needed to understand these experiments. I read all the supplementaries of all these experimental papers, and they are, you know, 50 pages long. So if you have a mistake in page 37 at the bottom, someone's going to read that. Make sure, and it's your name on it, so, you know, make sure there's no mistake. And do not hesitate to go deep. Right? You had to, you know, learn chemistry and learn all these experimental. We, we're just a bunch of theorists, right? And I know more about these experiments than the people who do them now, unfortunately, because, you know, my brain is not infinite in room. Interdisciplinary is sometimes a bliss. The only way we could have done this kind of thing is because I'm a physicist who sits at a chemistry department and Jonathan is an optical physicist sitting in an electrical engineering department. And, you know, there was kind of uh, an interdisciplinary blob. And I could go to Anat and go to a, 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 all the chemists, friends that I have, and tell them, you know, tell me what's going on. So that was very, very good. And I think the most important lesson to me is that we need to be honest. And, and I think this was mentioned by, by a, a Sebastian. They did the honorable thing and retracted the paper. That's the honest thing to do. We say, okay, we understand that our results, our title does not come out of the data that we show. We're going to correct that. Either, you know, publish an erratum or something like that. This is the only way in which science can be uh, useful to us. And this is, I'm, I'm talking about what we talked about it. it what you mentioned, you know, that we want science to, to reflect truth about reality. The only way we can achieve that and achieve uh, um, a level of confidence in science is that if scientists are honest, and in many, many cases, they are not. So we have a problem there. And people like me and Sebastian, we're trying to fight this kind of dishonesty, uh, sometimes with like sometimes with not. And with this, I'm finishing. Thank you for listening. Oh, I'm keeping you off your coffee, so yes, be so, brief. <laughs> yes. So questions, short questions. Aseba. So basically, in spirit, what you're saying is the same story as the Palladium, but in my story, the authors were honest, and in your story, Reproducible. No, it's not. It's it's actually not useful at all. The, the, it, the, the, not being honest is is uh, um, is a downhill. It's not useful. Okay. They're they're saying this is the mechanism and we can use it. Now, if it's not the mechanism, they cannot use it. But still, they are, you know, selling to people that they can. It's not useful. It's it's a complete. It, if they would do the honorable thing, then I would say, yes, it's, ni it's, it's nice. But it didn't turn out that way. So when you got up in the conference and tell them you are wrong, what did she reply to you? You should have been there to understand. <laughs> First of all, it wasn't me, it was Jonathan. He's, um, I, I am more polite than him, believe it or not. <laughs> He's even less uh, uh, polite than me. And she was saying something, and he was, you know, saying, well, because you are doing this and this and this, your, entitle, your entire uh, um, statement is completely wrong. Of course, the entire room goes quiet, all eyes go to us. And then she puts it on another 
graph and says, but we, but we did the calculation and showed this. And then he very uh, calmly, in a James Bond manner, says, yes, but the units on the y-axis of this graph are wrong. Therefore, this graph is, com which was correct, actually. Therefore, this graph is completely wrong, and again, your results are useless. And this went on and on and on until the chair had to intervene. <laughs> True story. Last question. Yeah, I think I heard uh, Naomi talking about uh, gold uh, nanoparticle and irradiation. Yes, this used, is. Used for, 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 for uh, prostate cancer. Sure. She invented the field, the field of heating a nanopart of, of shining light in nanoparticles for heating them. She was the guy who discovered that they are very good heat sources. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. She knows this. Yeah. And, uh, the, we didn't say anything that she did not know. It was just not hype enough. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so you're all invited to a coffee outside and cookies, and we've. <laughs> no.